Um, before I start teaching today, I have a couple of announcements related to this week. Um, so the beginning of the semester continues to be terrible for me. So office hours today are moved. I'm sorry about the last minute notice. Um, they're going to be 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. instead of right after class. I just had something come up that I didn't really want to do but had to do. Um, if you have quick questions, if you're planning to come to office hours and you have a quick question or two after class, I don't have to like take off right away so I could hang around up here until the next class kicks us out. Um, but I will have to leave shortly after that. But I will be back in my office 3.30 this afternoon. If anybody wants to stop by then, you're welcome to. Um, if this messes up your plans for visiting me today, um, I may also, I should be able to also schedule virtual appointments with anybody for tomorrow, first half of the day, if, if anybody's interested, so just let me know. And then Thursday, there won't be any office hours because I'll be busy with meetings all day except for the brief time that I'm here with you in class. Um, so this has been a semester of apologies, but again, I apologize for that, but it will get better after spring break, I promise. And then Friday, we have our exam review. I sent out information, and there's information in, in Blackboard as well. Uh, again, because of my crazy schedule this week, um, the start time for that is undetermined, but will likely be between 2 and 4 p.m. It will be recorded, so if you don't want to, you know, deal with, with my unpredictable schedule and just watch the recording, you're, of course, welcome to do that. It will be available sometime that evening. Um, and I'll send out a announcement via email and Microsoft Teams when I'm about ready to start, probably 15 minutes before the start time, so that if you are available you'll be ready for the start of that but this will be the only one that's like that as i said this is just a, a really bad time of the semester for me for various reasons but it'll get better all right we're, what we're also going to start with today before i get into the material is our, our weekly reminder about uh study habits and things related to how you would earn a good grade in this course and with the exam coming up in one week so it starts one week from yesterday uh, depending on your time slot, it'll be either Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday of next week. So there's always the question, you know, how do you've kind of been in the honeymoon phase of this course, not having to really worry about exams yet, but here we go. Um, so how do you know if you're prepared? Um, I've emphasized this throughout, but again, as you get into that last week of preparation, it's a problem-based exam, just like the homework questions. It's you know binary, all or nothing. You either get it right or you get it wrong. There's no partial credit. So the best thing to do is to do as many practice problems as possible, and you want to work your way up to doing those without your notes to help you, without your friends or anybody else just kind of on your own, because that's how the exams are. And there's plenty of opportunities for that. You can take advantage of, of all of them. I mean, there's um, practice homework assignments. None of you guys have checked this out yet, or hopefully by now you have. After the homework assignment closes up, um, you can still do additional attempts of that same assignment ungraded. So it gives you more of a chance, especially good if you, you know, save some of those towards closer to the exam. You can do that while you're preparing for the exam, and those questions often are, are similar to exam questions. Um, and then the exam review that I've mentioned for Friday has a set of 20 questions. They're, they're not actual exam questions, but they're um, the same distribution of topics as the exam. So, um, you know, I wrote the questions myself. They're not out of the test bank, but you'll if, you know, get an idea from there which topics are going to be covered at least. So you can use that to help you out. And it is encouraged that you try those problems before the review session. because I'll go over the solution to those. And if you've already tried them before that, it'll help you figure out, okay, if I didn't get this question quite right, why was that, as opposed to just trying to, so you either you know do these before you come or do this before you watch the video if you're gonna do it that way. And then the Blackboard will have a practice exam. It's not available yet, um, but it, I think it opens up Friday at some point, so a few days before the exam starts. Um, so that one is an actual set of test questions. There's just one for the whole class. It's not like the actual test where it draws from a bank. It's just you know one question per problem. But again, the distribution of topics and the difficulty and style of questions will be something that you can take with you as you as you finish your preparation. I recommend doing the practice exam towards the end of your study period, not last minute because you want to have some time to address any of the topics that you had trouble with, but make sure you kind of treat it like a mock exam where you think you're ready to go do that exam with, without any resources, see how it goes, and then you know clean up some things at the very last minute if you need to. And then in terms of you know my recommendation for group studying, I mean, I think it's good. It helps keep you motivated, gives you different perspectives on how to learn things that you may not have thought of yourself. Um, but as I, as I already said, the exams are individual, so you have to make sure that you're not um, you know, using the group studying as, as sort of a, 
as your exclusive method of preparing so you need to do individual problems as well. It's easy when you're in a group to convince yourself that you understand something, but until you actually sit down and do it yourself, you may not be sure about that. Um, and I've been given recommendations all semester, so if you've been following those, I think most of you will be happy with how the exam goes. And it's just, it's 20% of your grade, so it's significant, but it's not the end of the world. If it doesn't go well, but you do need to, um, you know, it's good to get off to a good start, and you do want to make sure that if the exam doesn't go your way, you kind of figure out what you need to do better next time. So I'm around and available for advice and suggestions as we lead into that. All right, let's get back into the material, though. So we were going through VSEPR last time, which is a method for predicting the three-dimensional shapes of molecules. It's strictly a geometric approach, um, and it works really well when you have a defined central atom with some number of outer atoms and lone pairs around that. So we had gone through two, three, and four electron groups. Um, so two was the linear arrangement, and then three electron groups is trigonal planar. One lone pair makes that bent. And then we finished with four electron groups the first time we had to think of three dimensions where you had tetrahedral arrangement, and if you have... Um, one lone pair becomes trigonal pyramidal, two lone pairs is bent again. So now we go to five electron groups. This one is not terribly difficult to visualize, but it does have a, a one weird feature about it compared to the other ones. So let's go to the simulator first. I hope you guys spent a lot of time this weekend going through this. It's a lot more enjoyable than Netflix or TikTok or things like that. Um, all right, so here's the simulator again. We can add as many electron groups as one up to six. So we're going to do five. Let's do five atoms. That's four. No, that's five, is it? Yeah, okay, there you go. So that, that's what the geometry looks like. So this is going to be called trigonal bipyramidal. The best way to visualize this is you have a triangle of three atoms around the side of the central atom, and then you have a flagpole coming up and above and below that triangle. So that's what trigonal bipyramidal looks like. So this is what you get with five electron groups, the best arrangement of those to minimize repulsions between the electron pairs. All right, so it's called trigonal bipyramid or bipyramidal and it's just a triangle with one sticking up and one sticking down so the way that we would draw that on paper there's sort of two ways to draw it one of them um, not as easy to tell but perhaps more conventional you'll see so as we talked about last time you have your central atom and then if you want to indicate that you have an atom coming towards you out of the plane you put a, a solid wedge going back away from you is a dashed wedge so that's going to be our triangle sort of on its side in this case, and then you have one above and one below the triangle to finish out the trigonal bipyramid. Perhaps an easier way to visualize this, as we said, is you have a central atom, you have, this is not, the, you have a triangle around it, so you have, so basically think of it as trigonal planar, which we covered last time, but then an additional x that's perpendicular to the plane in each direction, one above, one below. So that's trigonal bipyramidal. So it's not too difficult to visualize. The only um, difference with trigonal bipyramidal is it's the first and really the only electron group arrangement that we have more than one bond angle present. So we talked about bond angles as a way of further defining these structures and up until now we've had a single bond angle, 180 degrees for linear, 120 degrees for trigonal planar, 109.5 for tetrahedral. With trigonal bipyramidal we actually have two bond angles. Um, so the first one is if you look at two atoms that are in the triangle, by the same argument we made for trigonal planar, these are going to be 120 degrees apart. So all three of the atoms that are in the triangle are separated by 120 degrees to spread them out as much as possible. But you have another bond angle present, which would be between one of the atoms on the triangle and one of the ones sticking up above and below, which we call the apical atoms. So this angle here, because it's perpendicular arrangement, is going to be 90 degrees. So you have two bond angles in trigonal bipyramidal. That's the one difference we have compared to the other geometries. So you have both 90 and 120 degrees. All right. So that's what we have for five electron groups. And as we've also emphasized last time, if you have AX5, so you have no lone pairs in the central atom, the electron group arrangement and the molecular geometry are both trigonal bipyramidal. They're the same thing. But we can also add a, uh, one or more lone pairs to this structure. So let's see what happens if we do that. So if we have AX4E, that's still five total electron groups, but now we're going to put one of those in as a lone pair and define the, the shape of the rest of the atoms that are, that are remaining. So we'll start with the trigonal bipyramid structure. And then we have to put a lone pair in one of these five positions. For the first ones we talked about last time, it didn't matter where we put the lone pair. All the positions were equivalent, 
and we could just throw the lump here wherever we wanted. But here again, we have two different unique positions. We have the three that are around the triangle that are 120 degrees apart from each other, and we have the two that are above and below. And it may not be totally intuitive why this is the case, but when we're placing lone pairs, we want to put them in the place that minimizes repulsions. Lone pairs have stronger repulsion than bonding pairs. So those, those need to take priority in terms of being as far away from everything as possible. And even though it might not be intuitively obvious, the best place to put it is on the triangle. So whenever you have lone pairs in a trigonal bipyramidal structure, whether it's one, two, or three, we're going to cover all those possibilities, they always go on the triangular base, never on the top or the bottom. So that's just something that you, you'll want to definitely remember. Um, and then the rest of those are going to be the atoms X. All right, and then in terms of you know bond angles, again, we have two. Because of the lone pair, they're going to get compressed a little bit. So this one's close to 90, but a little bit less than 90. And then this one here, still close to 120 degrees, but a little bit less because of compression from the lone pair. Um, but then in terms of what we call this geometry, this is the one that most the most people will will get tripped up on for whatever reason it's, it's true even when i review this stuff in a graduate level course it's the same story there so it's not unique to general chemistry students what we call this is a weird name so to visualize this better let's turn it on its side and go to the simulator for that so if we remove one of those and put a lone pair in so this is kind of how we drew it uh see this, this this is hard it always folds up on itself so you have to be really careful when you rotate it or else it'll fold up on itself all right there we go so that's kind of how we drew it we put the lone pair over on the right this doesn't really give you the best description of the structure so if we turn it over on its side though this is going to make it more obvious why we call it what we do so we call this geometry seesaw so as you can imagine if i can do this without it messing itself up it rocks like a seesaw like that all right so this is called the seesaw geometry. So when you turn over on its side, it becomes more obvious that that's the case. Um, so it's, it's called seesaw, and as I said, if we draw it like this, where we put the whole thing on its side, and then the lone pair goes up here now, that's gives it make it a little bit clearer that this is called seesaw. All right. So seesaw geometry is AX4E. I guess I should give some real examples of these guys doing that last time. So this would be, we'll probably see this one later on, but PCL5 is an example of AX5. AX4E is not particularly common, but you would see it in SF4 uh, as an example of seesaw. So they all, these all do exist. As I said these aren't fictions of our imagination, but some are more common than others. All right, now with five electron groups, though, we can also have more than one lone pair. So there's two other possibilities where the total number of electron groups is still five, but we have different combinations of atoms and lone pairs. So for AX3, E2, still five total, but now two of them are lone pairs. As I said, the way to remember how to do this is you start with a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement there's five electron groups anytime you have lone pairs they always go on the triangular base so one of these three positions so it doesn't matter which two of those three get lone pairs the way that we do it that makes it easiest to visualize what this is called would be to put them here and here but any of those two possibilities is fine so that leaves X's there and again it's sideways but this one's a little bit easier to visualize because they're all in the same plane we would call this t-shaped so it's on its side but clearly it's there's a T there, okay? So we call this T-shaped. And here we we no longer have 120 degree bond angles because two of those three positions on the triangle are now occupied by lone pairs. Bond angles are only between atoms. So these bond angles are now gonna be close to 90 degrees only. So we have a 90 degree angle there, a 90 degree angle there. A Little bit less than that because of the repulsion from the lone pairs, but we would still predict that it's close to 90 but not quite 90 because of the repulsion from the lone pairs. All right, so that's T-shaped. An example of this, we have a lot of these inner halogen compounds that would form this arrangement, like IF3 is an example of that. All right, and then finally, the last possibility with five electron groups is AX2E3. We talked about last time, if you have three atoms in the formula, AX2, it's either gonna be linear or bent. Um, so AX2E0 was linear, 
AX2E was bent, AX2E2 is bent. Here's the last one that has three atoms in it. Let's see what it turns out to be. So we have five electron groups in a trigonal bipyramid. And as we said, all three of those lone pairs now have to go in the triangle. Anytime you have lone pairs in a five electron group arrangement, you need to put them all on the triangle. So we put all three lone pairs here, here, and here, and that leaves the two outer atoms exactly opposite each other, 180 degrees apart. So this one goes back to linear when there's three lone pairs present. And here, the bond angles are exactly 180 degrees. They're not less than or anything off from that because we have lone pairs pushing in both directions equally on each side. So they're going to stay exactly 180 degrees apart. Um, you know, this lone pair pushes that way, but the other ones push back. So you get exactly 180 degrees for this. There's no net distortion because of the lone pairs. So that's, that's the last one that would also be linear. AX2 with three lone pairs becomes linear again. All right, so any questions on five electron groups? As I said, the only difference is that you have two bond angles and two sets of non-equivalent positions, but as long as you remember that all the lone pairs go on the triangular base, it's usually pretty easy to piece together the different possibilities. All right, as high as we'll go now is six electron groups. So there's gonna be three geometries that include six electron groups. So if we put six things as far apart from each other, the best way to do that geometrically is to end up putting them all mutually 90 degrees apart. So it looks like this. Um, it's called octahedral because if you draw a triangle through each set of three adjacent atoms, there, there, and there, you make eight triangles around that. But that's not the easiest way to visualize it. The easiest way to visualize it is kind of like we did for trigonal bipyramidal, but this time it's a square base. So you have a square of atoms around it and then one sticking above and one sticking below the square. That's for me the easiest way to picture that structure. So everything is 90 degrees apart, the four that are in the square base and then the one above and one below all 90 degrees. So this is another one where every position is equivalent, um, just like the rest of them except for the trigonal bipyramidal. Okay, so for AX6, it would be drawn like this. So if you have your square base sort of perpendicular to the page and then one above and one below. And just like before, perhaps a more intuitive way to draw this is to actually draw the square where you have an X in each corner of the square and then one above the square and one below. All right, so we call this octahedral. I thought I had a picture of an octahedron here, but I don't. But it's called octa, not because there's eight electron groups, but because there'd be eight triangles. Hedron means side. So if you draw a triangle through each of these three, like that, and you do each set of adjacent, there's four on the top, four on the bottom, eight sides. So That's why I call it octahedron, but six electron groups from a chemistry standpoint, which is what we care about. All right, so this is octahedral, and every position is 90 degrees apart, so all the bond angles are 90. The four on the square, that's obviously 90 degrees apart, and then the one above and below the square, also perpendicular, makes it 90 degrees. All right, so AX6 would be an example of that would be SF6. And this one is fairly easy to identify because if you have six atoms bonded to the central atom, you don't even have to draw the Lewis structure. It has to be octahedral because you can't have, we don't, we, I mean, it's not that you can't, but in our case, we're not going to have AXC, AX6E or AX6E2. If there's six atoms on the central atom, it has to be octahedral. There's no higher order of geometry than that. So those ones are easy to identify. So SF6 or PF6 minus, which is an anion, has six atoms on the central atom. They have to be octahedral. There's no other geometry that would accommodate six atoms around the central atom besides that. So those are easy to find. Now the rest of these though, you do have to go through the effort of drawing the, the Lewis structure to figure out how many lone pairs there are. So with six electron groups, we can have AX5E where one of those six is a lone pair. So for AX5E, we start with the octahedral arrangement, square base, one above and one below. And now we have to put a lone pair in one of those positions. All six of these positions are equivalent. As we said, they're all 90 degrees apart from each other. So it doesn't matter where you put the lone pair. For visualizing the geometry, it's easiest to put it at the bottom in this case. Because so that leaves the rest of these as X's. And so what you have in this case is a square pyramid. So we had trigonal pyramid or trigonal bipyramid before. This is a square pyramid, square base with now just one capping atom. I think that's the same shape as the Egyptian pyramids, if I'm not mistaken. 
I think they're square based pyramids. So anyway, if you've seen that shape before, that's what it looks like. And so this is called square pyramidal or square pyramid. And again, because of the compression from the lone pairs, the bond angles are going to shrink a little bit, but still be close to the ideal value of 90, but a little bit smaller. We can't say how much smaller. And an example of this would be, let's see, I think IF5 is one. So there's these inner halogen compounds that have different numbers of atoms. And, and so if we go to the simulator for this one, I guess I didn't do all of these ones, but we'll do this one here. The simulator only lets you put six electron groups. So once you put six on there, you can't put any more. They're all grayed out. But this is how we drew this one. And as we said, it's a square base, those four atoms that make a square, and then one that sticks above the square, so a square base pyramid. Um, all right, so that's square pyramidal AX5E. And then the very last possibility for us with also six electron groups is to put two lone pairs in. Now when we're arranging the two lone pairs in an octahedral arrangement, we do have to think a little bit about where those go. Um, so it's six electron groups for AX4E2. So same electron group arrangement. Um, but then this one here, we can put the first lone pair wherever we want because again, they're all positions are equivalent just like we did in the last one. So we can put the first lone pair down here where we put the first one last time. But if we have two lone pairs now, lone pairs also repel each other more strongly than they repel bonding pairs. So if we want that second lone pair to be as far away as possible from the first, where do we think it should go? On the top or on the side? Top. top. So we want these two lone pairs to be as far away from each other as possible, so they have to go in that arrangement there. Any, any two that are 180 degrees apart is fine, but it's easiest to see the geometry if we do it this way. And so then what that leaves is just four atoms in a square, which if we draw it in two dimensions would just look like this. You'd have a lone pair coming out towards you, another lone pair going back away from you, but in terms of the shape that the atoms occupy, it's just a square. Now usually that's going to be called square planar, not just square. Um, and the bond angles are exactly 90 degrees. Um, but if you if you if you prefer to call it square, that's fine. I had a um, I had a professor in grad school, really smart guy. I mean, Nobel Prize contender, so he's not like a, sm a schmuck or anything. He was always mad about calling it square planar because he said, "Well, when have you ever seen a square that's not a plane?" And he's right. So square planar is kind of a redundant terminology, but um, that's usually what we use in chemistry. So we call it square planar, or if you like, you could just call it square. Um, but it's just four atoms arranged in a square. And again, it's because we need the lone pairs above and below the square that they would arrange themselves in that way. All right, so that takes us through all of the different geometries. Um, just want to do like a little bit more about bond angles, uh, just to give you some idea about you know some predictions you'll have to make. As we've already talked about when we went through all these structures, lone pairs cause bond angle compression. So if you have one or more lone pairs on the center atom, particularly if you have one, it's definitely going to happen. Um, you have to you know, think about the possibility of those bond angles of the rest of the atoms getting compressed a little bit. We can't say how much they, they shrink or what exactly they are, but they're going to be a little bit smaller than the ideal value. So lone pairs do that. We've already talked about that. The other one which I don't think will really come up in homework assignments and tests, but just for completeness I'll include it here, is if you have multiple bonds, either double bonds or triple bonds, those will repel a little bit more strongly than a single bond as well. And that makes sense because you have more electron pairs in a double or triple bond than you do in a single bond, so more electrons are going to repel strongly. So if we have this structure here, Uh, what is this even called? This, this, I think this is one of the, you guys have heard the, about the terrible accident in Ohio where they spilled all kinds of vinyl chloride everywhere. I think this is phosgene, which is one of the, don't quote me on that, it's one of the combustion products. That's, it's pretty nasty stuff, but it is, it's relevant to the news. Anyway, this is, the point of this though is that if you have this double bond here, your prediction, and these predictions aren't always perfect, but your prediction would be because there's two bonding pairs in this bond here, they're going to push down a little bit on those ones, a little bit stronger. So you'd expect that this angle here would be a little bit less than 120 degrees. 
because of that compression. Ideally, they're 120 because it's AX3, but because of that compression, this is a little bit less than 100, and this one, these ones would then, to compensate, be a little bit bigger than 120 on the other sides where that is pushing down. So there's a little bit of an effect of double bonds and triple bonds. I don't think that's something that we're going to really examine you on. It is important to realize, and this is why in the last example we just did of AX4E2, we put the two lone pairs 180 degrees apart, is that if you have repulsion between two lone pairs, lone pair, lone pair repulsion, that's going to be the strongest. And, and so that's why when we're placing lone pairs, we want to prioritize getting them as far apart from each other as possible if there's more than one of them. So for trigonal planar, they have to all go on the triangular part to get them as far away from each other as possible. And then for square planar, they had to go opposite each other when there was two of them. So that's the strongest. So that's just a little bit more about those effects that we've kind of mentioned throughout. Um, so any, any questions on the theory of VSCPR before we practice it a few times? Okay, so let's just go through some examples then of determining molecular shapes. Um, and remember, we have to re remember there's two terminologies. So there's electron group arrangement and molecular shape or molecular geometry. Those two things mean the same thing. Um, but electron group arrangement is a little bit distinct as we talk about. This moment, we're acting for the molecular shape. So this always starts with a good Lewis structure. So even though this Chapter 4 stuff is not on the first exam, Lewis structures are, so you need to be good at that already and it's, it's very relevant to chapter four as well so if we draw the loose structure of pcl3 let's go through all the details of this one i think we actually did this one in class but we'll review it here so you have to count electrons first we have phosphorus and chlorine and i don't have the periodic table open here so let me open that real quick so you have to count the the valence electrons for phosphorus and chlorine so phosphorus is here in group 15, so in it, or sorry, number 15, group 5, so it has five valence electrons. Chlorine is here in group 7, so each one has seven. So we count valence electrons first, five for phosphorus, seven for each chlorine. So we have one phosphorus in the formula, which provides five valence electrons, three chlorines that provide seven each and the total will then be 26. So we need to place 26 electrons around the center atom correctly. Now the nice thing about VSCPR and the other topic in this chapter that relates to the Lewis structure, which we'll get to next time, the nice thing about it is you don't necessarily need to have a perfect Lewis structure with you know, all the double bonds correct and all of the you know formal charges and things minimized and stuff like that. It doesn't really matter. For VSCPR, all that matters is how many atoms are there around the center atom? Well, clearly there's three because there's three atoms in the formula. That part's easy to get. And then how many lone pairs are on the center atom? So as long as you get that part of it right, that's all that matters. If you you know if you don't have all the double bonds drawn or anything you know missing little things like that, you're still going to make the correct prediction about the shape as long as you know the number of atoms and the number of lone pairs that surround the center atom. So for PCl3, we know there's three atoms. It's AX3 something, but we have to figure out if there's any lone pairs on the central atom or how many there are to be able to correctly predict the geometry. So we still need to draw the Lewis structure at least most of the way through. So when we do PCL3, we start with single bonds to each chlorine. We complete the octet on each chlorine by putting in three lone pairs, six more non-bonding electrons on each to give them a total of eight, two from the bond, six more. And so then at this point, we figure out how many we have left and whether we should put any lone pairs on the central atom. Three octets, three times eight is 24. This structure has 26 electrons. So that leaves two more for the central atom. So we put two more there. So this structure here would be AX3E or AX3E1 because there's one lone pair on the central atom. Um, and then again, whether you do it by brute force memorization or what I prefer is to actually try to visualize the structures as best as you can, four total electron groups is a tetrahedral arrangement. One of those is a lone pair, doesn't matter which one, but it's easiest in this case to put it on top. Oh no, this, this nonsense again. I think, my, I think there's something with this simulator because this happened last year too. So let me give you guys an unplanned break while I reset my tablet because there's no way out of this that I've found besides that. <laughs> get rid of you because you're causing problems. 
All right, picking up where we left off after the unplanned interruption, we had four electron groups, AX3E, so one of them is a lone pair, which will go up here, or any of those four places, but it's easiest to visualize if it's up there. And that leaves a trigonal pyramidal structure, three at the base with the center atom is the apex, so trigonal pyramidal. All right, so that's how we would predict PCL3. Any questions on that one? All right, and then we'll do one more, which is, or a few more actually, which is one, this one's an anion, um, CO3 2 minus, which is called carbonate. Um, all right, so for carbonate, we again would need to count the valence electrons. This time we have two minus charges, so we have to add those in. So we need to find the valence electrons for Carbon and oxygen. Carbon is group four, so there's four valence electrons. Oxygen is group six, so there's six for each of those. So we have one carbon with four valence electrons. Uh, sorry, three oxygens, CO3. Six each is 18. Then we have a two minus charge, we have to add two additional electrons to the total and make it 24. All right, so this one has 24 valence electrons, and this will give us an idea of how we don't necessarily need to get all the double bonds and things correct to do this. So if we have CO3 two minus, we'll start with single bonds to each oxygen, complete their octets, two minus charge if we want to keep track of that. So we've done three octets, three times eight is 24. That's all of our electrons. So this is one that does not have lone pairs on the center atom. A common pattern we'll see is that carbon very rarely has lone pairs, so this is an example. Now we could stop here to get the shape of this molecule. This is a terrible Lewis structure because as you quickly recognize, the center atom only has six electrons around it and it's, it should have eight, should complete its octet. So for drawing a Lewis structure, we wouldn't want to stop here, but for, the shape we could because all we really care about is how many atoms there are, which is three, and how many lone pairs there are, which has now been established as zero. Um, and so this would just be AX3 or AX3E0 if you like to write the E's in explicitly. But we will predict now that this is going to be trigonal planar. Three electron groups all arranged 120 degrees apart. Lone pairs on all these that we don't really care about. Now as I said, in reality, this is not a good Lewis structure, but it's enough to give us the trigonal planar geometry. If we wanted to finish the Lewis structure, we'd have to complete the octet on the central atom, so we'd have to take off a lone pair from one of the oxygens and make it a double bond to do that, but that still would be X3. So drawing in double bonds doesn't change how many electron groups are around the central atom. That's all we care about for the shape. So this would be the best Lewis structure. You'd have two other resonance structures where the double bond can move around. So this is, you know, there's more to this, but However much detail you go into with a Lewis structure, you would get AX3 and you would predict trigonal planar. Okay? Any questions on that one? All right, and then the last one we'll do is um, a very uncommon compound in a very uncommon geometry, um, but one that is still, I think, pretty neat. So this is xenon tetrafluoride. So from the periodic table, we need to count electrons for xenon and fluorine. And, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the properties of elements and the reactivity of elements and things like that, but, you know, xenon is over here in the noble gas column. It's in group eight. And we think of, you know, we call them noble gases or inert gases because they don't typically react with things. But there are rare examples, particularly with xenon, of compounds that have that as part of the formula. So xenon tetrafluoride that we're talking about here is one of those. So xenon is in group eight, so it would have eight valence electrons. And then fluorine is in group seven, so each of those would have seven. So when we're counting up valence electrons, that's what we would use. Eight for the xenon. And then seven for each fluorine. So this is going to be 36 valence electrons. So when we draw the uh, Lewis structure of this one, with xenon at the center and then four fluorines around it, We complete the octets of the outer atoms first, 
And in doing that, we've done four octets, which is 32 electrons. So there's still four more for the central atom. We have 36 total. So we get two lone pairs on the central atom now, one there and one there is fine. And so in terms of the AXE notation, the formula tells us that it's AX4. And now by completing the Lewis structure, we see that there's also two lone pairs, so it'd be AX4E2. So a total of six electron groups, four plus two is six. So we're gonna have an octahedral arrangement. And this was the very last geometry that we talked about in generic form, where you'll put the lone pairs opposite each other. Fluorines on the square, and that makes the square planar. All right, so square planar is kind of uncommon, but this would be an example of a compound that has that geometry. And as I said, you cannot just look at the formula. If you just said, oh, xenon tetrafluoride, four things, it has to be tetrahedral, that's not enough because you have to also account for the lone pairs to get this molecular shape. So it's an octahedral electron group arrangement, square planar molecular shape. And that would be how we would handle all of those. So you have, you have to draw at least a decent Lewis structure to get that. You have to make sure you at least have the correct number of lone pairs on the center atom to be able to do that. All right, any questions on VSCPR? All right, so this table here kind of summarizes it. I'm not a big fan of, you know, brute force memorization, and I discourage it whenever I can. So I would not encourage you to just you know, blindly memorize this, but it can be a helpful guide for you. Um, and there's not that many possibilities as you see here. It's, you know, these are all the ones with zero lone pairs. These are all the ones with lone, one lone pair. And then there's a few with two lone pairs. So there's, what is that, like 12, 15 total possibilities or no, 13. So it's not even that, that many, but um, you do need to be familiar with them. And like I said, sort of being able to visualize the shapes is gonna be helpful rather than just memorizing them. But you can use this as a guide as you're learning this. Um, all right, so that's the end of VSEPR. So the other thing we're gonna cover today, which is closely related to it, or follows directly from it, is molecular polarity. Um, and so there are, there are a lot of properties of molecules that are determined by their shape. We don't just determine the shapes of molecules because it's a you know curious, fun fact about the molecule. It actually does have relevance to chemistry as well. It's gonna be particularly important when you start talking about things relevant to you know, organic chemistry and the reactions that organic compounds undergo, the shapes of the molecules can, can play a critical role there. The only thing we're gonna talk about in this course that's directly related to the shape of the molecule is polarity, whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar. Um, and so let's, we're gonna define what that is and, and talk about how to use the shape of the molecule to predict whether it's polar or nonpolar. All right, so first we have to review polar bonds because we did talk about this in chapter three. Um, so for an individual bond to be polar, you just need to have two atoms bonded together that have different electronegativity values. That's something we covered a couple weeks ago. So when you have a polar bond, the, the polarity is oriented towards the more electronegative atom, meaning that's where you're more likely to find the electrons. They're shared but not shared equally is the way to think about that. So the classic example we gave was the HF bond where fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table, hydrogen significantly less so, and so a bond between hydrogen and fluorine would have a partial negative charge on fluorine, a partial positive charge on hydrogen, that's one way to indicate the polarity, the unequal distribution of electrons, or we do it with vectors sometimes too. And vectors are kind of helpful to think about when we start talking about the polarity of an entire molecule because we're basically thinking about, okay, if we have all these atoms arranged around the center atom and there's vectors in each bond that represent the polarity, do those vectors add together to form a net polarity or do they cancel each other out? That's essentially what we're doing here. Um, but it's, it's gonna be a little bit simpler than that, but that's really at the root of what it is. But for a polar bond, it's just for an individual bond between two atoms, pr predicting the polarity is relatively straightforward because it's based on electronegativity and how polar it is depends on the difference in electronegativity values between the two atoms. So if we have the the bonds between the carbon at, between carbon and all the halogen atoms, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, CF is going to be the most polar because fluorine is more electronegative than carbon, and that's the biggest difference. So that's going to be more polar than CCL. 
Chlorine is more polar than, or sorry, more electronegative than carbon, but not by as big of a difference. So the difference between those two, they're closer together. So it's still polar, but by a less to a less extent. Carbon bromine is a little bit polar. Bromine is a little bit more electronegative than carbon, but they're again closer together than the other ones. So that's less polar. And then carbon and iodine have basically the same electronegativity. So this is essentially nonpolar. All right, because the electronegativity for carbon and iodine are the same. So those are all things that we cover. Just to give you a quick review of some of the important topics about bond polarity. Two atoms bonding together, difference in electronegativity dictates the polarity, and you can predict it based on how far apart the two atoms are on the electronegativity scale. That's, that's how polar bonds work. But here what we're going to talk about is taking it a step further to molecular polarity. So not just the polarity of an individual bond with two atoms, but the polarity of an entire molecule, which in our case is going to have more than two atoms involved in the types we'll talk about. So let's talk about molecular polarity. So molecular polarity, sorry, let me try to find where we are, where we were. Ooh, all right, here we go. So molecular polarity is an uneven distribution of charge over a whole molecule or a large portion of it. And in this course, we're not really going to go too much beyond identifying what polarity is and how to sort of predict it. Um, but it is important in a lot of other contexts. So when you take organic chemistry and biochemistry, if you take those courses later on, the polarity of molecules is critically important for how things behave in those contexts. Um, but we're just going to learn what it is a little bit. So it's an une uneven distribution of charge over the whole molecule. So you have you know, one side of the molecule might have more electron density than the other, um, is what we're sort of talking about. Um, there are units for polarity, although we're not going to do this in a quantitative sense, but just to, again, for completeness, introduce you to this idea. The unit for polarity is called a Debye, abbreviated with capital D, and it's a product of two SI units. So it's 3.34 times 10 to the minus 30th coulombs times meters. So coulombs is the SI unit for charge. And what it, what this, again, we don't need to know this number or really use it, but what this tells you, the units are in coulombs times meters. So basically, if the bigger the dipole moment you have or the bigger the polarity of the molecule, you have a larger separation of charge over a larger distance. So the more charge separation there is, the basically the you know the bigger the electronegativity difference between the two sides of the molecule, and the farther apart that those poles of your dipole are, that's going to give you a more polar molecule. But again, that's just kind of potentially useful background information, but not directly relevant. And so the magnitude of the polarity is called the dipole moment, how polar something is, and is abbreviated with another Greek letter mu. But this is all background information, but um, the approach that we're going to take in this course is looking at the structure of a molecule, which we would predict from VSCPR, and using that information to predict whether the molecule is polar or not. And for most of what we're going to do, I don't want to say this is going to be 100% true on every homework question, but at least 90% or so of the, of the questions we would ask you on an assignment or a test really just require you to distinguish, is the molecule polar or is it not? We're not going to do too much with saying which molecule is more polar or less polar, unless the difference is because one of them is nonpolar, has zero polarity. But really, if you can distinguish that it is or is not polar, you'll be able to answer most of the questions we ask at the level that we expect you to know this. So that's really what we're getting into, is how to predict whether something is polar or not. So the first thing is that in order for a molecule to be polar, I can think of one exception to this, but, um, you know, it's again, just a, it's a rare one. You, you, the molecule must have polar bonds. And so that means if you have a homoatomic molecule, meaning a molecule that's made up of only one type of atom, you can predict just by looking at the formula, again, in all, all cases but one that I can think of, that it would be nonpolar. So if you have N2, 
P4, S8. We're going to learn about all these different forms of elements later on in the course a little bit. So some elements exist in these sort of polyatomic molecules. So sulfur would be eight sulfur atoms all bonded together in some way. So just by looking at the formula, you can already predict that this is going to be nonpolar. And that's because these molecules don't have polar bonds at all. Because the bond between two sulfur atoms is completely nonpolar, com perfectly covalent, because sulfur is the same electronegativity as, itse as itself. So if there's no polar bonds in the molecule, no difference in electronegativities, you can't have a polar molecule. The one exception, in case it comes up, you've heard of this molecule too in the news, I'm sure, ozone. It was definitely a big deal when I was your age because they, they were concerned about the ozone layer eroding and now it's sort of reversed itself, which is great. But anyway, O3 is an exception because if you draw the Lewis structure of O3, um, it's kind of a weird one. To complete the octet, you have to do this. And you, you end up having a positive formal charge on one side and a negative on the other, and then because of resonance it kind of moves around. So this one would be polar, even though it only has oxygen in the formula. But all the other, you know, elemental forms that we would see, nitrogen N2, phosphorus P4, sulfur S8, you can just predict from the formula that they're nonpolar because they have only one type of atom. Now that said though, if you look at the formula of a molecule and you decide that it does have polar bonds, so you have two different atoms in the formula with different electronegativity values, so you know that their bonds are polar. That alone is not enough to predict whether the molecule is polar or not. You still have to think about the geometry of the molecule. So just because you have polar bonds does not mean the molecule will be polar. That's the first point we want to make here. So the presence of polar bonds does not guarantee that the molecule will be polar. It may be, it may not be. It, that, that alone is not sufficient criteria. So if any of you are future lawyers, you would say that polar bonds is a necessary but not sufficient criterion to determine polarity of a molecule. So the molecule has to have polar bonds to be polar, but just because it does doesn't mean it will be polar, if that makes sense. So you need to also think about the geometry of the molecule to make that prediction. All right, so let's then talk in more detail about how that works. So if we start with structures that have no lone pairs on the central atom, AXM E0 structures, so XM can be 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, but there's no lone pairs on the central atom, and this is going to be true when all X's are the same, which will cover the vast majority of cases we'll look at, but it, this is a requirement. All X's are the same, meaning you have one type of outer atom. If that's true, and if you have zero lone pairs, you can already predict that it's going to be nonpolar. Any of those possibilities are all nonpolar. So AX2, E0, AX3, E0, AX4, AX5, AX6, all those are nonpolar as long as there's no lone pairs in the center atom and as long as all the X's are the same. Now in some cases this is pretty easy to see, in other cases it's you know, a little bit harder, but if we go to one example of an AX2 molecule, which is carbon dioxide, CO2, Okay, so we have carbon dioxide, it's a linear molecule, AX2, no lone pairs on the central atom, and we want to predict if this is polar or not. Now by this criterion here, it's not polar, but let's understand why that is. So we know that there's going to be polar bonds. Oxygen is the second most electronegative atom on the periodic table. It's way up here. It's to the right of carbon, so we know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So there is going to be polarity in the bonds. So we could draw that in this way, delta minus over here, delta minus over there, and I guess technically two delta plus over there to balance it, but there's you know, partial positive in the middle, partial negatives on the outside. If we draw it as a vector, I think we can, even, we can more clearly see why this molecule is nonpolar, because we have a, a bond polarity vector that points in this direction towards that oxygen, but we have an identical one that points in the opposite direction towards that oxygen. So there's no net polarity in this molecule. The pole in one direction is canceled out by the pole in the other direction, and so that makes this whole thing nonpolar. You can almost think about it like a tug of war. 
where there's no, no net pull in one direction, which means that there's no polarity in the molecule. So this one's nonpolar for AX2. An example with AX3, a little bit harder to see, but if you have BF3, the individual BF bonds are all polar, but this is a trigonal planar arrangement and all the vectors end up canceling each other out. Um, you'd have to break down these vectors into their x and y components to more clearly see that mathematically, but when you have three vectors in a trigonal plane pointing in, in each direction like that, they all cancel each other out. So this one's also nonpolar. So any of these AXM structures with no lone pairs are going to be nonpolar. And then one other example is carbon tetrafluoride. This one's three-dimensional, so it's really not intuitive at all. Um, but it's still no lone pairs in the central atom, AX4, E0 if to be complete. That makes this nonpolar. So there's a you know bond polarity towards each fluorine, each CF bond is polar, but when they're arranged in a tetrahedron like that, they all cancel each other out. Again, it's three-dimensional, so it's not intuitive, but that's what happens in this case as well. Yes? Uh, the double bond, you know, like in like in this case here, I mean, it. I, I suppose like the individual dipole moment of a CO single bond is probably different than a CO double bond, but the point is that they're both identical, so it doesn't really matter. If they're both double bonds like this, there's not going to be an imbalance of charge because they're both the same, but just in opposite directions. Um, so that's nothing you really have to worry about in these types of situations. Because if there are if there are double bonds in the structure. You know, if it's if it's this type of molecule here, where it's an AXM with one type of outer atom, all the all the bonds will be the same. If there is a double bond, there might be resonance, but it's going to be you know moving around the whole structure, and all bonds will still be equivalent. So all the bonds will be the same. And then you can just use this argument to predict polarity based on you know how many lone pairs there are. So that's mo molecules with zero lone pairs. You can predict are nonpolar. So that's kind of the first one to look at. Any other questions on this? All right, now if we go to molecules that have more than one type of outer atom, so it's not going to just be AX whatever, it's going to be AX and then some other type of X as well. So there's two different outer atoms. We'll give examples of this. You, these are mostly going to be polar. I mean, there's so many different possibilities. I can't say they're all polar, but the most common ones that we'll see are going to be polar. Um, and the reason for that, as we'll see, is because in this case, you have different bond dipoles, but they're not the same as each other. So even if they're pointing in opposite directions, they don't completely cancel each other out. So let's look at an easy example of this one. So if we have carbon, oxygen, sulfur, COS would be the formula. It's going to have the same structure as CO2, but we're going to replace one of the oxygens with a sulfur like that. Okay? So it's still AX2 linear. We would, a better way to describe this instead of AX2 would be AX, X prime where X prime indicates a different type of X around it. There's no standard way of doing this, but that's, that's slightly better because it indicates that there's two different X's on the center atom. One's an oxygen, one's a sulfur. But if we, if we predict the polarity of this one, we have a significant dipole from carbon to oxygen. As we talked about last time, there's a big electronegativity negativity difference there. For carbon and sulfur, they have really similar electronegativity values. Sulfur is a little bit more electronegative than carbon, but it's a much smaller difference than carbon and oxygen. So you'll have a small dipole pointing this way, but it's not nearly as big as the dipole that points towards oxygen. So now we have two vectors that are pointing in the opposite direction, but their magnitudes are different. One is a big vector, one is a really small one. And so in net, there would be a dipole moment pointing in this direction. There's a net dipole pointing left to right, as I've drawn it in this case. So this molecule would be polar. So it has no lone pairs on the center atom, but because it has two different outer atoms, the two bond vectors, the two dipole vectors, don't cancel each other out. So that's what you would get. And then another example would be, um, if we do a tetrahedral one, that's AX, X prime three. There's a lot of um, organic molecules like this. So this one here, um, if you watch, you know, like old, suspense movies they use this molecule to knock people out it's really not quite as easy as they show in the movies but have you heard of chloroform you know you put a little cloth of chloroform cover someone's mouth and supposedly they just like fall asleep in like two seconds it doesn't really work like that but anyway uh, it's still not good to breathe it in so chloroform looks like this it's ccl3 so it's, te it's a tetrahedral molecule but one of those is a hydrogen the other three are chlorines
Right, and so again, two different types of outer atoms in this case. So if you look at the um, the dipoles in this case, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so you're going to have a dipole pointing towards each of those. But then for carbon and hydrogen, they're again kind of similar to each other, but if anything, carbon is a little bit more electronegative, so you'd have a small dipole pointing in that direction. So these dipoles don't all cancel each other out because they're not all the same and they're not all pointing in opposite directions of each other. So this molecule would have a net dipole pointing top to bottom as I've drawn it and make it polar as well. So you don't necessarily have to go through that level of analysis every time, but in general, if you have two different types of outer atoms, even if there's no lone pairs on the central atom, it's pretty typically going to be polar. I could, you, you, could, you could dream up some exotic exceptions to that, but in general, that's the prediction you would make without having to do any higher level analysis than that. Um, so that's going to be true for, for that situation, which is not as common, but one that you might see. Now another one though that's very easy to predict the polarity of are structures that have one lone pair. So this would be AXME1 or just E with one lone pair. So we saw, you know, there's a lot of um, structures that fall into this to be AX2E, AX3E, AX4E, AX5E, all those different possibilities. But if it has one lone pair on the central atom, be clear about that, we're talking about the central atom here. In that case, they were all, they're always going to be polar. So again, you don't even necessarily have to draw them out or think about them in more detail. If there's one lone pair in the center atom, the molecule will be polar. All right, and so some examples of this. If we have ammonia, which is NH3, we would predict an AX3E structure, one lone pair. So it's going to be a tetrahedral arrangement. We'll draw it actually as nitrogen. So you have nitrogen at the center, bonded to three hydrogens with one lone pair in one of those four positions. And so nitrogen is more electronegative in this case, so you're going to have dipoles pointing towards nitrogen, but there's no dipole pointing in the opposite direction because there's no hydrogen up top there, and so this will make this whole thing polar. So this is trigonal pyramidal is the geometry, but whether you know the name of the geometry or not, with one lone pair it has to be polar because you have a net dipole sort of pointing bottom to the top as all three of those vectors sort of point in the same direction towards the center atom. And there's a, no, there's a lone pair up here, so there's no opposing vector to cancel those out. And then if we go to SO2, you would get AX2E in this case. And again, with one lone pair, and this one's easier to see, you have a vector pointing that way vector pointing that way. They don't cancel each other out because they're not exactly opposite each other anymore. There's a net dipole pointing down. Think about tugging on both those oxygen atoms. The whole molecule is going to move down. And so this would be polar as well. And sort of as a corollary to this, you know, statement that structures with one lone pair are polar, there's also, you can also make the statement that all bent molecules are polar. So this is AX2E, which fits both of those um, patterns, but there's also AX2E2, which is bent, that would be polar as well. So any bent molecule would be polar, this would be one example of that. All right, but with one lone pair, that's the main point of this, you can predict that it's going to be polar. So the only ones that get a little bit dicey at times are those that have more than one lone pair. Um, so with one lone pair, it's definitely polar, with zero lone pairs, it's definitely nonpolar if all the X's are the same. But then we have some examples of geometries that have more than one lone pair. And so those ones may or may not be polar. So that's not a very decisive statement. But you have to, for those ones, you have to sort of think about it individually. And there's only like three or four of those. I think there's only three of those possibilities anyway. So it's not like it's that hard to remember all of them. There's only three. But if we go with two lone pairs, If you have AX2E2, an example of this would be water. And this one would be polar because you have a bent structure. As we said last time, all bent molecules are polar, so this fits into that category. 
Um, but then if you go to if you go to AX3 E2, this one would be, for example, um, ICL3. You get a T-shaped molecule. So this one will be polar as well because you have these two dipoles basically cancel each other out. But this dipole here points left to right and does not get canceled out by anything else. So this one will be polar for AX3E2. Um, and then the other one would be, well, if we have AX4E2, the last structure that we covered, we saw that xenon tetrafluoride was an example of this. So if we draw it, it's just in the plane like this. There would also be a lone pair above and below this plane that we talked about, but we don't need to consider that for polarity. In this molecule here, you have dipoles pointing towards each fluorine, but they all cancel each other out. Those two cancel each other out. The one up and the one down cancel each other out. So everything cancels it out, and this would be nonpolar. So with two lone pairs, you have two that are polar, AX2E2, AX3E2, one that's nonpolar, AX4E2. Um, so again, there's some of each in that case. Hopefully this one is clear why it's nonpolar. In a square plane, it's almost just like two linear molecules superimposed. So you have two dipoles pointing opposite directions horizontally that cancel each other out, and then also two pointing vertically, one up and one down, that cancel each other out. So there's no net uh, unequal distribution of charge. And then finally, with three lone pairs, the only, op the only one we had with three lone pairs was AX2E3. So an example of this would be xenon difluoride. So this is going to be, you have lone pairs on the triangle, as we talked about. This one is linear, and so it's going to be nonpolar. So all linear molecules are nonpolar, provided the two x's are the same. So if you have xenon difluoride, you have dipole there pointing up, dipole there pointing down, they cancel each other out, so that makes it nonpolar. So with these different possibilities with more than one lone pair, two of them are polar, two of them are nonpolar. And you have to, again, think about the geometry or just remember that. There's no shortcut for that. Um, but polarity is important. We're not going to, as, as I said, it's not going to be something that we talk about a lot in this course, um, but it is fairly important for some of the properties. So the polarity of water in particular is something we'll come back to later in the course. So we have to, you know, we're not going to totally forget about this after chapter four. The polarity of water is important because that determines its ability to dissolve other polar substances. So an important part about polarity that we'll get to not really until, I think it's like, we talk about ionic compounds probably in chapter, I forget what chapter six or so, and we'll come back to a little bit maybe in chapter nine. Um, the, the polarity of water is important because it's able to dissolve other polar compounds. So knowing that, you can then answer the question, if a brown bear and a white bear both jump in water at the same time, which one dissolves first? The white bear because it's polar. Okay. So polarity will be something we come back to later on. We start talking about compounds that are able to dissolve in different substances. Other also a topic in, chapter, in, in Chem 2 that's going to be relevant. All right, let's just finish off then with a few examples where we're going to draw the structure of molecules and then determine whether or not it's polar. Um, and as we said, the vast majority of homework questions just require you to identify whether or not it's polar and if you can do that you'll be able to answer the question. So this one is specifically about that. So if we have PCL5, um, I'll go through the Lewis structure quickly because we've, we've reviewed those a few times already today, but phosphorus and chlorine So there's one phosphorus, which is five. Chlorine is group seven. So this has 40 valence electrons. I think we did this structure a long time ago, but we'll review it again. So when we draw the structure of this, we have to get, um, to get the shape, we need to know how many lone pairs are on the center atom, and then to get the polarity, we have to also know that. So when we draw this out, All right, so that's the Lewis structure. Five octets is 40 electrons. That's all we have, so there's no lone pairs for the central atom. So this would be an AX5 or AX5E0 structure, if you like to, if you like to write that out explicitly. 
So that's the electron arrangement for this particular molecule here. So for the molecular shape, if it's five electron groups, that makes it trigonal param bipyramidal. And because there's no lone pairs, that means the molecular shape is the same as the electron group arrangement, so those would be trigonal bipyramidal. And then in terms of polarity, as we said, if there's no lone pairs in the center atom and all of the outer atoms are the same, they're all chlorines here, that makes it nonpolar, whenever you have zero lone pairs in the center atom. So it's trigonal bipyramidal, and because there's zero lone pairs, it's going to be nonpolar. All right, so the fact that there's zero lone pairs in the center atom has two consequences. One, it means the molecular shape is the same as the electron group arrangement, and then also it makes it nonpolar. So getting these Lewis structures at least reasonably correct and then relating them to both shape and polarity is going to be a significant part of the first half of Chapter 4. So any questions on that? Yep? So that's Well, if you draw the... This one's reasonably correct, but if you draw it actually in the... Um, as accurately as you can... I'm not going to pull out the simulator again because it'll crash my tablet, but um, or possibly will. So anyway, what you'd have is it's, this one's a little bit harder to visualize. These two dipoles are easy to see that they cancel each other out because one is pointing up, one is pointing down. Then you have three in the triangle. So we talked about trigonal planar separately. So the three vectors in the triangle also cancel each other out. It's not as obvious that that's the case, but if you break them down into their x and y components, they would add up to zero in both directions. Um, and so basically the one that points left to right is going to be canceled out in total by the ones that point um, in this direction, and then those two y components are going to cancel each other out as well. So it's, it's kind of like a superimposed trigonal planar and linear situation. Trigonal planar, these three all cancel each other out, and then the two that are above and below are kind of like a linear molecule that also cancel each other out in that direction. Um, so it's not always easy to visualize, but again, if you just remember that zero lone pairs means that it's nonpolar, that's the most important thing for answering these types of questions. All right, any other questions on this one? How many more of these do I have? I think just one more. Okay, good. So we're getting close to the end. All right, now we have IF3. So we're going to determine its shape and then indicate if it is polar or nonpolar. All right, so for IF3, they're, they're both halogens. So they're both going to have seven valence electrons, one iodine with seven, and then three fluorines with seven. So there's a total of 28 valence electrons in this molecule. So when we determine its Lewis structure first, We complete the octets on the outer atoms, always following that same pattern. All right, so three octets is 24 electrons, eight around each fluorine now. There's 28 total, so whenever we have leftovers, they go on the center atoms. That means there's going to be two non-bonding pairs or two lone pairs on the center atom, like that. So this is the two-dimensional structure. In terms of the AXE notation, it's going to be AX3. That's obvious from the formula, but we've determined now that there's two lone pairs, so it's going to be AX3E2. Okay? So for determining the shape, again, if you don't want to just memorize the table, we have five electron groups. That we should, we definitely need to know is going to be trigonal bipyramidal, same electron group arrangement as the last one. But this time, two of those are going to be lone pairs. The lone pairs have to go on the triangular part of the molecule, so one of these three or two of these three positions. Doesn't matter which two, but if we put them there and there, the structure is easier to visualize. So we get fluorines in the rest. This one is sideways, but it's going to be T-shaped. Alright, so the shape is T-shaped. And then because we have two lone pairs in this case, we do have to think a little bit about whether it's polar or nonpolar. There's not an obvious pattern for that when you have more than one lone pair. Um, but for this one, hopefully it's fairly clear that these two polar bonds are pretty much going to cancel each other out. That's not entirely true because they actually do like bend a little bit because of the lone pair, but they're basically opposite each other. But we have this one unique horizontal IF bond pointing left to right, so there's going to be a net dipole pointing left to right. We don't really need to know the direction, but it's, it's going to be polar because this IF bond that's horizontal, I've drawn all over this, you can't really see it anymore, um, but this IF bond here that's in the horizontal direction 
has a dipole that's not canceled out in the other direction because there's a, just the lone pairs there, no other, no other atoms. So there's a net dipole left to right in this, which means that it would be polar. So AX3E2 is one of the structures with two or three lone pairs that would be polar. So to sort of extend then the VSCPR table that I gave you earlier, this one includes also whether they're polar or nonpolar. These predictions work when all X's are the same. We have to remember that there's that caveat. If there's two different outer atoms, that generally leads to it being polar, whatever the situation is. Um, but for most of the structures we'll give you, all the outer atoms are the same. And this here gives you an idea about whether it's polar or nonpolar. All right, any last questions on today's material? All right, as I said, there's no office hours directly after class, but I can stick around until the next group kicks us out if anybody has any quick questions. Um, and I will be back in my office at 3.30 this afternoon if anybody else wants to stop by then. Um, are they going to be recorded? Yeah, they'll be recorded. Okay. Uh, 